Welcome back. Today's guest is a very special man. I am lucky enough to call him one of my best mates. It's Sam Doherty, the one and only. An unbelievable story of determination, grit, whatever you want to call it. The guy has a massive dog in him. He doesn't give up. And he, as you'll hear, his story is one that I urge you all to listen to from start to finish. The baggers are on a roll. I tried to tell him that they were going to win the flag and encourage him to say that as well, but he's not taking the lid off right now. I am. Enjoy the episode. Uh, it's one of the best. Hey, guys. Welcome to the Dan Does Footy Podcast. You can find more of Dan Does Footy on the website, Spotify, YouTube, and social media. See ya. I was heaps of sick kids and I was like, where are they? Kick them harder. Kick them all harder. Punch them in the face. I'm bloody horizontally trained, if you get what I mean. Boner. Oh, no. <sighs> I'm proud today. <laughs> Should we say this is the line? If you don't hear the next bit, it's over the line. Okay, so if you don't hear the next bit, I've got a line. This is more past part road. Right? It gives in. Um, before we do start, I think that it'd be a good idea maybe if you give me a compliment, like something, you know, thank you so much for helping us last year. The boys were so inspired. Um, just give me a compliment because I'm, I am nervous and I know you are the guest, but I think it'd just be a nice thing to do. No. Nah. <laughs> <clears throat> okay, guys. Uh, today's guest is a big one. It's Sam Doherty. Sam, you were just telling me off air you have something to say straight up. No, no, okay. nothing. Mm. Oh, um, we do have a big guest, as I've said. Sam, thank you for joining us, mate. You are the first guest of Dan Does Footy and you're in the locker room. Thoughts are good? You like this thing? Yeah, I like it. have done well. You've got going mate. here, mate. It's, Thanks. Um, it's interesting. There's your compliment, but. Um, thank you. No, it's very professional. Thanks, mate. Appreciate it. Which, and is, which is great. I don't know. Ollie probably didn't tell you, but he went to the gym for the first time <laughs> in how long? Mm, eight months. Do you have a microphone on you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got yeah, one. Cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you've done a bicep. So we're not just going to ignore that fact because you sent me a photo last night in a sling and yeah. you haven't brought the sling in just because Sam's here. Yeah, I want to act tough. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted to act tough in front of my girlfriend who's a Pilates instructor last night. That didn't work it out. It was unbelievable. Yeah. You sending me – bicep, full bicep tear, you reckon? I reckon bicep into forearm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's – But it was um, at the gym, I promise. Fair enough. Um, mate, you can be relaxed here. It's just an SEN. Uh, I know you are a very good performer on your three OWs, your SENs, but this is relaxed. You can tell us things that you wouldn't tell anyone else here. Um, yesterday we spoke about the 19 players who are earning a million dollars. Mm. How much money do you earn? <laughs> Funnily enough, I've actually been asked this on the piss by one of our mutual oh friends. Oh, my God, you have as well. <laughs> yes, you have. It's such an awkward question. Over the space of your wedding. Um, oh, twice, uh, I reckon. Yeah, I, I got interrogated about how much I earn, which is a bit awkward. But, uh-huh. yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a long way off those 19 True. trucks at the top. I also, yesterday when we spoke about it when we were recording, I went through what I was on. I'd love for you to have a guess at what you think, because you play with me. What do you think my highest contract was or would have been? I feel like you would have been uh, 180 in matches. That's pretty good. Yeah, that's very good. Was that, is that what you think he was on at Gold Coast or Carlton? I reckon it would have been Gold Coast. Yeah. Very good. 175, I think we said, didn't yeah. we? And matches. That's, That's yeah. great. You should be – it's too much. It's way overs. Even I said it's way overs. <laughs> but I um, I do have a bone to pick with you straight away, and we did speak about it before we started recording, but you and I had a heated argument over one of the breaks recently, one of your breaks. I'm never on break. I'm always on. But we spoke about – and again, back to my career. What would you rather be, someone who could have been anything or a bloke who – just got the most out of himself, played 41 games. So the reference was me being anything, like I generally could have been anything, which I think you to a point might admit. Yeah, yeah well, I, I did agree with you. You could have been anything. Yeah. That you were lacking the habits and the work ethic well, to yeah. kind of get to that. Well, you and I had contrasting styles. but And then you <laughs> said that you'd rather be a Nick Graham who just like got the most out of himself. Yeah, well, I, I guess that's probably a little bit of – where my respect goes of my teammates and mm. that I've had over the years, I've always been one that loves the guy that mm. gets as much as they possibly can out of themselves and 
they mightn't be the most talented guys in the room, but they tend to forge great careers and mm. um, be some of the better teammates you've had. And we had this argument that you, you think that it's better to just yeah. have in the back of your mind that you could have been dusty at one point. And I think so. <laughs> it's better for the ego to be like, I definitely could have been anything. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, but you, but yeah, I think it's hard for you because you're, and we'll talk about it. You were pick 12. So you have, you've lived up to the expectations, mate. Like you have, you've done Australian BNF wins. Like you have lived up to it, but someone like me who just hasn't got near it, but I know internally I could have, <laughs> it's a very different mindset. Like I just, yeah, I don't know. I, I don't know. I feel like we're not going to agree on this because I, I, you're firm in your camp, and I no, feel like not. I'm. I feel like I'm firm, and you took a lot of offense out of me taking. Nick's I was pretty and angry. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Yeah, we were at some kind of uh, day thing, and we got pretty heated towards each other, and it was a long, like, forty minute argument. Um, but look, we'll agree to disagree on there. First impressions of you and I meeting. I came into your territory at Carlton. <laughs> what was my first impressions of you? Yeah, you didn't. Like a lot of my friends, we probably weren't great friends in footy. No, um, no. Maybe because you lacked work ethic. <laughs> which you hate at the start. Which, which we've just spoken about that I don't enjoy. So, um, no, you you didn't speak much for it was very quiet for the first year, which is a bit unlike you now yeah. that I know you. But um, sort of quiet, went about your business and then you sort of developed your own little crew that used to sit in the back of the room and mm. um, your personality started coming out and I found you pretty funny. And Thanks, mate. Well, you're right. We were day. super different. You and I were very different when we first met. You are... And you still are disciplined and like hardworking and I'm going to put this team on my back and you better get on or fucking get out of the way. But I was like, I'm just picking up a paycheck here. Like <laughs> literally I'm having to play twos, be on my whatever I'm on and just get out of here. Um, but you are going through pre-season. You're almost at the back end of it now. How's that body? Uh, 30 years old now? Yeah, 30. Getting on? Feeling? Yeah, well, I am. I'm feeling every bit of it. Mm. I suppose when you have... 150 surgeries or whatever. You've had a few, I've, haven't you? I've had a few. So I, there's, there is lingering effects of, of each one. But um, no, I was able to do a lot of load this um, this preseason, which has been great because yeah. I haven't – with um, some of my cancer surgeries and ops and chemo and stuff, I really haven't done a preseason for about five years. So yeah. um, although I came in with an off-season surgery this year, I was pretty much able to do the whole load through through preseason. So we, um, we play – this week, which mm. is um, which is exciting because, as you know, in footy, with that when that program yeah. swaps over from preseason mode to in season mode, it's oh, heaven. It's heaven. So, um, so we're just getting into that now. So the repeatable thirteen k sessions, yeah, sort of two and a half times of your game load during the week is um, yuck, is yuck. is down. So um, yeah. I'm excited to get started. To be honest, yeah. What do you get? Like I, for someone like me, when I was playing, it was very much like I need to impress here. But you who like. You obviously solidified yourself. You're a current legend, superstar. What do you get out of preseason? Like, you is it just literally being like, who am I working with defenders around me? Is it let's get the game plan right? Was it literally just a ticker box, get the cobwebs out? I think probably elements of all. Yeah. Um, I still have the the drive to want to impress and yeah. Um, like, I think you need that in footy because if you don't have that, then you tend to just tick boxes and get through, and you don't actually get any better and. Mm. Um, you do have to realise that there's young guys coming in every year and guys making big gains in their game. Yeah. So if you don't try and get better and come back in really good shape and try and make gains in your game, even at my age, then guys will take over you. And yeah. um, I have that, but then I also have probably the level of knowing my body and knowing what it needs to be able to mm. be right um, for, for the season. And it's probably something that I've learned over the years to be able to make sure that making gains but not tipping myself over the edge. I think early in my career I probably tipped myself over the edge and went into seasons with lingering injuries and um, which ended up impacting my ability to perform in season. So um, there's there's lessons and there's probably elements of both. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. We've got – I'm a quite a good runner at our group and we've got like Very five good. or six guys that are well, well in front of me these days and I'm sort of doing the same thing. It's just showing the new athlete is coming. Like we've got – I think we've got like five, six guys can run under six minute two Ks. Crazy. Which like Flying. when I first started, there was I don't think anyone would have been near Ed would have been probably the only one that was near it. So yeah. um the caliber of athlete coming through these days that the kids are so professional, they come in and they pretty much jump to the top of the tree in terms of some of the athletic profile. So yeah. Um yeah, you gotta you gotta keep your skates on otherwise. Crazy. Well you like, can run because you took me for an absolute run on my wedding day both <laughs> probably a little bit under the weather the night before and you just burnt me all the way for 10k so you definitely can run um just sorry back on pre-season 
I, this is all foreign to me because I just, we, as I said, we had very different mindsets about careers. Do you consciously make an effort each preseason to improve on something for the season ahead? Do you look back and go, you know what, good, like last year, for instance, great season, but I didn't like how I did this. Let's work on that in the preseason. Uh, or not? Are you just rock yeah. up and let's evolve and see how we go? No, pretty targeted in what I go after. Um, this year's been because I played a lot of midfield minutes last year. I, I probably um, learned over the back end of the year that my body needed to be a little bit stronger. Um, playing half back, that was not a sort of prerequisite to playing mm-hmm. half back. You don't get a lot of hits. You don't, not a heap of contested work, whereas in the midfield you do. So I sort of needed to make sure that, one, I needed to put some size on my upper body. That's part of probably why my shoulder ended up going because I mm. didn't have a, I didn't put much effort into much focus, not effort, focus into my gym program in my uppers last year. And um, I definitely needed to do a bit more of that this year to be able to um, not so much like play better, but to play more consistently to be able to take the bumps and hits. And um, so that was a bit of a focus coming in. And then um, a lot of around sort of the stoppage connection um, was my big goal this year was to be able to make sure one, I'm all over it and um, not just from a, a knowledge level of being able to do it, but understanding the way that the system works, where everyone should be, mm. um, understanding who I'm working with, what their strengths are, what my role is outside of that. So um, being able to put in a fair bit of study and sort of thinking time around what that looks like and yeah. then actually training it um, was probably the other thing I really went after this year. So, um, yeah, I think pre-season is, is a good time to build connection with your teammates and understanding mm. – um, what everyone's strengths is. The reality is you're, you're playing a team sport. You need guys to play their way and then everyone needs to offset each other and allow each other to flourish in their their parts and um, hide the deficiencies in others. So um, mm. it's been a pre-season of probably thinking that way. I've got to ask you on your shoulder just because it's come back to me then. So you pop a shoulder out, Demons prelim? Uh, uh, yeah, Demons semi, final, semi. semi. Yeah. Demons semi. Ball gets kicked to you. Someone comes across you, come over who, and you go up both arms. This is the sequence where Akers kicks a goal. Yeah. You go up both arms. Two questions. Did you – was it just a I'm getting this ball, no conscious effort of the shoulder? Um, I, I, was, I, I was probably lucky that – so when I came back on Because he came my shoulder, in hot, that goal. I actually didn't know he was there. Okay. But before before that, I um when I came back on, I think it was like after halftime or whenever it was – um. I had a, a mark in D50. So mm. I, I ran as a player, as a wing, I ran down to defensive 50 and I had to go up for a, a mark. And at that before that, I'd, I really, all I'd done was a Carried very, around. very funny sort of fitness test with one of our VF, VFL boys, <laughs> Sam Durden, who was playing. Uh, he was at one of our emergencies and we did like a, just probably a the worst of... fitness test of all time. It was but, it one of those ones where it's like, just, just see if it's okay and then just – the. Staff was like, get him out there. Just go. Oh, there was there was a lot of dirds acting like he was trying to hit me quite hard <laughs> and me trying to act like nothing it's hurt. All good. And and to be honest, it was it was like it, it wasn't great to yeah. be honest. But then yeah, I was lucky. I in my, my first probably three minutes on the ground, I had a ground ball that I had to take, and then I had an overhead mark in defensive fifty. If I dropped it, it's a certain goal. Yeah. So um I sort of ticked off a couple of the mental hurdles pretty quickly in the quarter. By the back end of the game that was full adrenaline I yeah. you don't think about it at all of course you wouldn't be and mate, we were there i was absolutely blind but i just remember seeing that sequence and being like oh my god first of all i saw it unfolding i saw you out in the wing and whoever it was come across you i was like he's have to go upstairs and get up this ball his shoulders cooked and then my second question is when you boot it forward did you mean to pick anyone out? Because it looked to me as a drunk spectator, this bloke's having a ping from 70. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not a great long kick for goal um, on the run. Yeah. So I knew I didn't have it in me. Um, the hard thing was there was actually like, I don't think many people have looked behind the goals, but there's there's a lot of people free inside 50. And it's hard to kick. It, well, it was like, I didn't know who, like Charlie was free in the, <laughs> Charlie was free in the pocket. I think Tom DeConning was leading up at me and then I had, a 3v1 in the goal square, which yeah. was Blake, who's a winger, not supposed to be there. No. Gov, who's our one of our backmen, and Kempi, who's one of our backmen. So they're all in there. They're all in the <laughs> goal <laughs> square. Just stream forward. So I think they've gone the all out offensive play, and I don't know how. It's it's very – like Blake kicks the goal, and it's Gov and Kempi celebrating with him. Crazy. So, um, it was – yeah. It, like looking back now, I to be honest, I saw a 2v1 in the goal square, and I thought, well, we're the best chance of winning just that one, go. so let's just get it there. So. Dang. Unreal, unreal. Like I said, just like literally probably the best game I've ever been to, and we'll get to it in the back end because I circle back to it eventually. But your story here, and it's just, as I texted you last night, it's just 
you're an amazing human being and what you've been through is just wild. Everything that we're going to talk about and we're going to literally dissect your journey from start to finish. Normally, this stuff that happens to you, to any other player, the system and the history tells us that you don't play long as you should. You don't come out the other side as good as you have. And I wouldn't be doing your story and, and listeners justice if we don't go step by step through the roller coaster. So I want to go back to Phillip Island because I've been to Phillip Island to your house one night and kind of driving through Phillip Island, not a lot to do there as a kid. Am I right in saying that or not? Oh, Okay, here is there's something, is there? Penguins. <laughs> there's remember no, the there's penguins. Not. been there. Have you been there, have you? Yeah, penguins. Yeah, there's penguins. There is yeah. penguins, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's, there's, there's the penguins there. Now, there's, it's like any country town. Yeah. Like the difference with Phillip Island is there's there's a lot of events that happen there and it swells on Easter weekend. Got the uh, motorbikes. The motorbikes. Yeah. They've got like, the V8s, the superbikes. Like there's there's a lot of bits and pieces that happen. Yeah. So that it sort of goes from – but when there's no one there – No. There's no one there. There's a lot of penguins. But then everyone comes down. There's a lot of penguins. Have you actually seen the penguins? No, well, I did some study that the population was 7,000. The population of penguins down there is 40,000. <laughs> so it's like, what's that? I don't know the conversion on that, but it's a lot of penguins. Yeah. I haven't and, seen and you penguins. have to pay to see them. You don't so have who's to pay doing to see that? Them. Actually? It, oh, it's a stitch up. It's a, it's a money making exercise. That's a they, genuine stitch up. You go there and you, you wait for them and they waddle up the beach and then. They got chlamydia as well. <laughs> really? They do. Koalas of the sea. I made that up. I don't know. Yeah. I said that. That's not. Um, okay. So not a lot of Pingwood. How about childhood? Mum, dad, Annabelle, Eddie yep. growing up. Josh, brother. Yep. Normal childhood. Yeah. I, I was very fortunate as a kid. Um, my my mum and dad provided a great environment for myself and my brother. And um, mm. yeah, like they, 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 looking back now, you don't know this at the time, but they showed, they probably taught us a lot of habits that have been really healthy yeah. um, moving forward. Some unhealthy but which i'm mm. sure we'll unpack at some stage but yeah. um yeah my parents gave me and josh everything that we needed yeah. probably um didn't come from the wealthiest family and mm. um mum worked full time dad worked two jobs milked the cows in the morning and then yeah. ran his own um, building business and then when that got too hard he ended up working at the penguin parade Man, as well penguins. as as well as milking so we sort of we sort of grew up um half on the farm half yeah. um at home so um yeah, like very lucky. Looking back mm. now, I'm probably becoming a parent now. Um, I probably realise how great of a job my parents did, and mm. um, doesn't guarantee you all successes in life, but they definitely set no. me on um, my journey. It's crazy when someone said this to me that day. It's like um, be gentle on your parents because it's their first time parenting too. And I'm sure you now having Ruby would be like, "Whoa, this is a lot harder than I probably gave credit for." Yeah, definitely. And I, I think you you tend to realise that. Um, None of us know what we're doing. So, no, fuck no. <laughs> so all parents are just trying to figure it out as they go. And yeah. um, it's it's funny when you leave hospital with your first <laughs> child, it's like you get in the car and it's like you're sort of sitting there going like, is Whoa. there a handbook of what we're yeah. supposed to do? Like what they just, they're just giving us this baby to go home with and we don't really know what we're doing. And uh, there's still elements of that now. Like Nat like and I are still trying to figure out what we're doing. Yeah, it's um, crazy. It's a great ride and um, – it definitely gives you the appreciation of what your parents did mm. for you and um, the thing you do realise is everything that you do as a parent, generally you'd pick kids pick up on them. So yep. um, all the habits and personality traits as much as um, they're probably born with some that a lot of it is picked up off the influential people in their life. It doesn't have to be parents but there, there's a, f a f sort of inner circle of what your kids are around. They're going to have a yeah. significant influence on who they are in the future. For sure, for sure. And you – um. I was doing a bit of research on just, again, I know it, but I wanted to make sure that we do it the best way possible. You wrote this, and I can't remember if it's in The Age or The Herald, but you said, as a kid growing up on Phillip Island, the annual bus trip to the MCG was always the event of the year. You see, I was brainwashed from birth and supporting Carlton by my mad, by blues mad father, Eddie. That bus trip, just off its head, was it? Yeah, well, we used to, thinking back now, but um, used to leave school for early on a, on. I think it was a Friday. I don't think it was always a Thursday night, but Friday night to go to the Richmond versus Carlton game. Um, young kids with a bunch of the dads. Um, look, mm. now these days I know that they now exactly they, just, they just got absolutely blind. <laughs> you know exactly what they're going to do. I don't, there must have been a designated driver. Yeah. I hope there was, but um, yeah, it was like great memories. We didn't go to many games. Yeah, been Phillip Island two hours away. It's a it's a yeah. fair trek to get up to watch it. Much football. 
Um, so we didn't go to too many, but that there was a lot of Richmond supporters and a lot of Carlton supporters in sort of my dad's family, uh, mm. friends, friendship group. So um, we used to roll up there on the, the mini bus, someone would drive us up, go to the game and, and watch the game and then yeah, drive home. Roll that down. The dads would be blind, the Gassed kids would be up. asleep. <laughs> but so the payoff was for them to just take you boys or who yeah. was there and they could just get on the piss and then get home. Yeah, essentially. Unreal. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Is that your real... Is that your first footy memory? Like, what's your first memory of being like, shit, I think I'd like football? I don't know. Like, I, I my, my family grew up, um, like, Josh and I grew up basically at the footy club. So between my mum and my dad, my dad coached nearly every age group possible at the football club. Mum was a c- committee member at stages. We were spending mm. three to four nights a week. I think one year my dad was coaching – I think it was my t- – so I was playing under 15s and he was coaching the reserves. He was coaching two teams on one day. So um, we spent a hell of a lot of time yeah. there growing up. Like I remember when dad was coaching the under 18s, I would have been about 10 and training with the under 18s. Mm. Um, it, but like my earliest footy memory is probably just Kick, which is most kids I think. Yeah. Um, I think Oz Kick was on a Friday night, so it was at night time. So you do the Kick again – Parents go, get, parents go get parents go get pissed yeah. at the at the footy club and the kids we just run free um, yeah. for the whole night um, have a feed and then go home but um, yeah, yeah probably probably one of my favourite memories of footy was um, was my first senior game I played with my brother yeah um, looking back now it's probably pretty special to me because um, I got to play a period of time we probably, like growing up I didn't think I'd be playing AFL footy so I thought we'd just playing senior footy at mm. Philip Island with me and him and um, looking back now, I, I, was, I was sort of lucky. I played really young and he was playing at the same time. We got to play a few years before I sort of yeah. have gone on and done my career elsewhere. People always say when they have a brother and the other one makes AFL, they said that their brother was probably better. Was Josh better or not? Uh, yeah. He, he was. Like elements. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I would say that if we're going back to the conversation earlier, <laughs> I think he was more talented than I was. Yeah. Um, but – Country footy, I think there's a lot of gems out there that mm. just don't get, get the overlooked. opportunity. They just yeah. don't get noticed, or for whatever t- period of their life, they they weren't the most mature at that stage and and weren't able to oh, make mate. the teams that they need to to get noticed. Whereas it's I feel politics. like in the in the city, you, you you get every opportunity. Yeah. You get forced forced into those programs. Whereas in the country, it's just a little bit different. So yeah. I think there's a lot of guys in the country that probably would have been great AFL players that just for whatever Man. reason, didn't get that chance and didn't Trust get the opportunity. Me, I can relate. It's all politics. Speaking from my experience in AFL. He'll, just... he'll, he'll love listening to this, me telling him. <laughs> really? More talented Good, I'm glad. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> Tell him that, yeah, that's great. Um, footy memories. Your, your Our football memories are a bit different because my first one is my old man taking me down to Redwood Park, me and him with a footy, and then he'd stand 20 metres away from me and he would just boot a highball 50 metres in the air and it would hang for about four, five, six seconds and then he'd just sprint at me and I'd have to stand under it because he was trying to teach me courage. But now when I explained that to him, Dad, I said, you don't – like you can't – that's not a drill. Like you, pro- I think you were just born with courage. Like if you're not built like that, you're not built like that. Um, and every Friday we'd go to the park and he'd just run at me and sometimes he'd come through and clip me in the ribs. There's a bit of if you can't dodge your wrench, you can't dodge your Well, ball exactly, mentality. yeah. So uh, that just <laughs> made me think about how our memories are so different. I'm sure no one's playing the courage game with you. So tack up. And guys, it is going to be a journey because we have to lay it all out just to see you and your story. But you obviously play down on Phil Island, Tac Cup. Now, you get picked, you're, you're picked 12 when you go to Brizzy. Mm-hmm. You said somewhere that you didn't think you were going to go that high. But surely, because I knew I was going that high. I, I just naturally as a junior, you know that you're, I'm better than this kid. Like I'm getting a lot of the footy. Surely you knew like I'm going high here first roundish no, no well I, I, even in juniors i was probably never the i was never the best kid in the team and um even through playing sort of the under under 15s carnivals under 16s carnivals for gippsland power i, I was never on like the a team um, oh you're in the possibles i was in the possibles that's the rare probables. for you as well <laughs> <laughs> you would have um, hated that <laughs> then um when i got to the under 18s um i got injured in my bottom age year in the tryouts so i didn't didn't get picked for the squad mm. um, and then sort of got picked in the squad for the under 18s. And that, that year was a bit of a whirlwind, to be honest. I went from like no one knew who I was, not on any draft boards anywhere to um, played half the year, went and tried out for Vic Country, got cut from Vic Country. Um, and then I was probably lucky that Vic Country played poorly in the first two games. Mm. I kept playing well at Tac Cup, 
so then my opportunity came in the um it was our third game we played western australia at geelong and i played really well in in big country and i sort of went from like nowhere to probably going to get drafted yeah and that was probably where i was at and that's that that part and then i went on to play the next game played really well against vic metro and went mm. from probably could get drafted to potential first rounder and yeah played well throughout the back end of the year of tac cup so i went from probably could have been first rounder to somewhere in the tens to Crazy. 10 to 20. so when we went to draft camp a, a lot of guys probably don't get interviewed with that many clubs because they sort of know the range they're at i mm. got interviewed with by every team other than gws which is yeah. With sauce yeah so i think every no one really knew where i was going and then as the draft firmed up it was sort of like on even on like the last mock drafts and that they yeah. do i was sort of like 18 to 20 then the day before i was like oh richmond are going to take him at 15 and then end up when went, went mm. to 12 to brisbane so yeah um Crazy. Just a crazy year. And then crazy. I think the lesson for anyone watching that wants to become an AFL player is that everyone's journey is different. It's You don't have to make every AIS team. Yeah, and, um, I did. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> um, you don't have to. That's not the – there's even yeah. SSP that weighs in the yeah. AFL system these days. So mm. um, it's just, yeah, everyone's journey is so different and um, you just got to take your opportunity when you get one. Yeah, for sure. Hey, Amy, can we please get some water when you're – you can leave that in, Ollie. No, it's all good. We're all raw. Just keep it raw. I like it raw. <laughs> Sparkling um, or still. Yeah. So did you want to leave Melbourne? You, you, we obviously know you go to Brisbane now, but did you want to leave Melbourne? Because I didn't want to leave Adelaide. And when I got taken to the Gold Coast, I was really upset. I cried in my room. No, I, I was I was honestly not fussed yeah. um, where I went. Okay. Um, I was, I was, to be honest, I was happy just getting picked up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the, the hard, there's something the hard thing about the draft is, is you don't know where you're going and it could be home, it could be away from home. But mm. um, pre draft, I was just happy getting on an AFL list. So I didn't care at all. Yeah. Yeah. I know it's such an SEN question, but they say, they keep saying every year the draft is too young, it's too young. I felt it was too young because I just wasn't ready to move out of home. Like, do you have the same thing or do you reckon let them play? They have to play VFL sample to the 2021 or is it just like they're ready, take them, pluck them? No, I, I don't think it's too young. I think the expectation on – the external expectation on kids coming in and, and probably somewhat the internal expectation of those kids coming in um, is probably too great. Yeah. It feels a bloody hard game and Man. the consistency of playing it week in, week out on your body um, is is hard and the, fir- the, the top five picks are like essentially Crazy. expected to come in to be superstars within <laughs> their off. first year and that's – the reality of that is really, really hard, and I think even for those kids, like they get they get pumped up so much these days, and everyone knows who they are before they come in the system. So they sort, yeah. they almost walk into the system thinking it's probably going to be easier than it is, and mm. they're just going to be superstars, which again is not the reality. It it's, it's a bloody hard game, but yeah, uh, there's 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 probably positives and negatives for both. I I look at it, you get kids in, and you get to teach them the habits. That are required but then there is a lag effect of when guys get that so mm. um yeah it's hard for guys to perform in that first year it is hard i mean i feel bad the one that obviously sticks out at the moment is harley reed like he went from last year a little bit of talk like he's obviously going to number one and goes to west coast on the back page of every paper and it's like you now win games for west coast yeah. which could and as a senior player not that i'm playing but i'd be like you know what fuck him not that i, I love how things wrap up i'd be like you know what let's show the media and Perth that this kid isn't ready yet. So now you've got eyes on you. Senior players being like, "Well, hold on, I'm still our turf. Welcome to the AFL." It is just like this immense pressure cooker. So, I mean, I don't know. While she, I guess, went through the same thing, he's yeah. come out the other side. But well, I think Harley that, that, is like a crazy at the moment. All this yeah, Harley and, that, stuff. and the hard thing for Harley at the moment is probably <laughs> the expectation of what he should be in. I say should mm. is he's supposed to be a superstar. So it's like if he's anything below that, potentially that's that's a very hard thing to have to battle with in your career. And we sort of saw that with Walsh. Walsh had an unbelievable first year yeah. and then still had people saying that, no, nah, he's not talented. And, mm. Do you know what I mean? Like that's yeah. the – It's the natural that's, thing. It's going to happen. The, Walsh couldn't have had much better of a year. And yeah. that's what guys come in these days and they have to deal with. And that's that's the new world that mm. is probably – it's part of AFF. It's part of the job now that yeah. you have to deal with everything external that happens at a footy club and yeah. sometimes 
you sort of get picked up and you just think it's footy. It's not footy anymore. No it's, there's way. A, there's a more broader conversation. And the thing is, it's like a full time job. Yeah. I don't know if you were saying, but you get there to a club and it's. I thought we were going to do the same thing in the Sandford. Like I just come in on a Tuesday, Thursday. I'll train for a couple of hours. I'll bounce and I'll see you guys on Saturday for a game. But it's like Monday, Tuesday. Like you know, the schedule is cooked. Like you get no time. Well, it's the, yeah, it's the schedule, and then it's the every everything in your life has an impact to the way you play footy. And I'm not, I'm sure that not every AFL player thinks that way. Mm. And I know a lot of guys that do, but I know a lot of guys that don't. But what you're doing on your day off affects your ability Massively. on game day because it's the time in your legs and yeah. everything. So it's like yeah, yeah, there's, it's al- a lot. there's elements of – Thank you. Yeah. There's mm. elements of you need to think about what you're putting in your body, what you're doing with your body, what yeah. how's that going to affect your ability to perform because if you don't perform then mm. there's contracts, there's there's external media pressures, there's internal reviews. So um, yeah, Every to have day. a consistent long career you need to – think about a lot Man, of stuff actually it's actually draining and i only say this i don't it's not about me at all but as we talk so much shit comes back to me but i was at a point where i thought having butter and bread was going to be the reason why i wasn't playing good footy like you get to such an extreme point in your head where you're like i can't go for like a, a walk a day before the game because you know i've got a game and i've got to save my energy i can't have butter and bread because my skin folds be fucked it's all consuming all the time yeah and that, that that's that's the job that's what we do get paid really mm. really good money and I'm not saying it's a negative. I'm just saying that that's that's the part of the job that's probably a bit hidden yeah. to a lot of people that a lot of people probably don't understand that um, there's pressures in every part of your life in terms of what you're doing and, um, yeah, some thrive in that environment and a lot don't and that's that's the reality of, <laughs> of yeah. where our game's at. We're a very professional game. And then you get those those supporters who watch the game like, oh, I wish I was getting fucking paid $500,000 to be a footballer. So it's shut the fuck. No, it's not. Like you have no – like you've just kind of labelled out like what actually goes into it. But shut the – like you don't have no idea. Like it's – for 10 months even more, it's all-consuming every day is related back to your central hub of footy. Yeah. Like it's just crazy, yeah. as you said. But we went off course. We'll come back. <laughs> Brisbane, drafted a Brizzy. They came 15th that year. Vossi the coach? Yep, Vossi coached me my first year and a half. Same Vossi now or learned a lot and better now? Oh, I'd say learned a lot better now, but that's what happens when you yeah. you learn the most when you probably fail, really. Yeah. And he's a uh, he's an unbelievable coach now. I, I'm seen a fair few coaches on my time in footy. Which but, we will talk about. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think he's got as close close to near perfect of what today's coach is and yeah. um, his ability to be firm but have care um, and sort of you still need that – in elements you still need to know who you are and you need to know what you are and he has that definitely but his ability to talk and communicate with his with the players but more importantly his coaches and empower them to be great coaches as well is, is pretty amazing. So, mm. um, yeah, d- d- different but I would say that – I was 18 years old, so I don't, I, I didn't know what I was looking at. So yeah. like I'm, I'm walking past him in the corridor, shit scared to talk to him. Like that's he's, he's very scared. He's a, he's a he's a legend of AFL footy. In my first year, I was so scared to even have a conversation yeah. with him. Is that different to now, or have I just grown up? I don't. Yeah. It's probably elements of both. I I know if you listen to him speak, he speaks a lot about his time away and learning from Brisbane. The, the relationship piece is what he's put so much time and effort and communication is where he's. Mm. Sort of put his tickets, and yeah. um, he's definitely doing. He's doing a great job with our group, and um, doing a very good job. Well, it's 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 probably both. It's like he's he came to a group that was ready to have him as a coach, and and we're sort of all blending well together at the moment. So, um, I mean, the first half was a bit rough last year. Yeah, and don't tell me that camp was the reason why things changed. That's <laughs> bullshit. Something must have fucking changed because you can't be that shit and poor for the first half of the year, and then be like, we're the best team for the next fourteen weeks. Yeah. I <laughs> There's a there's there's some very fine details. Whatever's down to Ed Kerno's farm, give me some. <laughs> I want some of that shit. <laughs> some pizzas and yeah. uh, and the dam. Um, no, nah, like we made some minor changes in terms of um, our game plan, definitely. Um, but they weren't like wholesale stuff. It was like really yeah nitty gritty defense and pressure stuff that yep. you probably don't notice that much. You probably notice the feel of it and yep. w- watching it, but. Um, in terms of the individual actions of the speed we were about to put yeah. pressure on in contest and um, our ability to, to fix up our mistakes and have a defense first yeah. lens was probably the big the big sort of mindset change. Um, but there's elements of it just 
we all bought in. So like mm. it, we all sort of had a focus. That was part of the, the reason for the fire down at Ed's was to mm. – as a playing group, there's there was stuff coming from everywhere. There was there's pressures. There was calling each other out. Well, no, it, it wasn't no. so much about that. But like externally, there was like Cripper shouldn't be captain anymore. Vossi yep. should be sacked. Like that's yeah. where that's where the environment was. And you and stayed at a different hotel as well. Yeah, I went Sydney. to. Yeah, I went to. <laughs> apparently, um, yeah, yeah. Nat stays at a different hotel. Yeah, Nat does as well. Yeah, and, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's um, true. But yeah, then there's there's a lot happening at that at that stage, and yeah. there's a lot of intense pressure on the footy club, which is which is what Carlton is, but mm. it can be a great thing because we saw in the back end of the year, yeah. the momentum wave's huge, but it can be hard to deal with at times. But yeah. no, that 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 night was designed around as players being able to go down there and just be open with everyone about how we're feeling and, and what's happening with mm. the club and what's holding us back. Um, but more importantly, it was more just everyone getting on the page of getting getting everything out and then let's all narrow down to something that's really simple that we can all do and all focus on. And we turned everything in the footy club towards the defense. Yep. That's yeah. where def- defense first team. And I, if you speak to anyone at the club, that's what we are. And yep. um, that's from the way we train, the way we speak in meetings, the language you use on our offense is more about the way we defend yep. to get the ball back. And um, we we made small little subtle changes there and then put a heavy pressure, heavy focus on pressure, which mm. is, probably the noticeable thing that changed and it's funny yeah. that it's not massive things, a bit of connection and a bit, a bit of defensive pressure and that changed our whole game. Mate, it looked it looked different as in like genuine enough enough. It looked a lot different half time, maybe after the first call of that Gold Coast game, it was like something has dropped here and it's just a different Blues team. Yeah, and um, there's elements of it just it all clicked at once. And, and it just went, yeah, off yeah, your way. Yeah, it went yeah. nuts. Yeah. Um, Brizzy, when you get there, do you do you get to Brizzy and think I'm spending 13 years here? This is my my whole career in Brizzy, or do you get there and go because at the time it was a bit of a flaming heap. They were going really bad. Um, when you leave, there's a max max exodus, so I'm sure that was a groundswell happening already. Did you get there going? This is I'll be here for a while. Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, I I I I had no intentions of leaving when I first got to Brizzy. I, my first two years didn't go the way I wanted to go. I was injured when I got there. Didn't play at all in my first year, second year. What'd you um, have? Hip. I had hip surgery as soon as I got there yeah. and um, that's basically lost all my pre-season. So then spent basically the first half of the year trying to get fit for AFL footy, started playing some really good games in the knee fall in the back end of the year, um, but didn't get picked. So then went away in that off season, mm. worked my ass off to get fit. I, I don't know the exact time, but I think I wiped 30 seconds off my 2K time trial, came back in great shape. Wow. Wow. Um, got sore in the back end of my that preseason in my back. So yep. set me back a little bit and then debuted in round four. Mm. Um, then the, that, that year was just sort of a bit messy. I, I think mm. I was sub six out of my first 13 games. Yep. Um, it was hard to get continuity of playing AFL, playing VFL, like yeah. whatever young kid goes through. The, and the NEFA was fucked back then. Like, were you yeah, there, did you play when we were playing like Mount Gravatt and yeah, stuff? Yeah, oh, we, we, if we played if we played with more than probably ten AFL listed players, we're winning by hundred. Yeah, points. so you get nothing out of it. We won the flag that year. Yeah, um, we had some we had some great like players playing in that team. That, yeah, um, and we played really well. But there's always the lure of coming back when things aren't probably aren't going your way as much. There was there was a lot happening at the footy club at that stage. Mm. Um, there's board overthrow mur- murmurings. Yeah. Vossi gets sacked. With about six games to go or five games to go, um, like and then you got then you got a lot then you got a lot of clubs saying, "Oh, come home, come home, come home." And yeah, um, in the end, the decision I thought was best for my career was to come back to to yeah. Melbourne and and um and play footy here. And and Carlton ended up being um the team that I that I chose. And lucky enough to interview with a number of teams back in Melbourne. And Carlton was the the standout of where I thought where I thought was the best fit fit for me to play a long AFL career in um, mm. in footy, and um, I've definitely been able to do that, although very interrupted. But yeah, um, yeah I, I think maybe if you play, if you play, as I was saying before, the expectations of kids coming through. I was young, naive, thought I'd play two hundred games for Brizzy, and yeah. when that path doesn't go the way you want, although very immature, um, the opportunity and the the, the the feeling of being wanted by the footy clubs is that's that's part of what happens, yeah. and you're an emotional roller coaster trying to go through, work out what's going on with your life, and yeah, um, yeah, I 
I made the decision to it wasn't so much yeah. I was homesick, which is what the no what no. the narrative is in the external. But it always is though. Yeah, and that's but that's fine. That's the back then that was the thing that everyone just hid behind. Yeah. It was homesick, and then that's what happened. But yeah, um, yeah, there's probably a little bit more to it than just that. I think you said it. You said it, and I've got it here because I also said did some research before. But you said that feeling of being wanted, and when those clubs do want you, you're like, well. I, I, I want to feel wanted. I don't want to feel yeah. like I'm in and out of the team or I'm not, you know, valued here. So it's only natural to want that. And the Doggies was one of those teams that wanted you and then they won a flag. Yeah. Well, Mel- Does, Melbourne, you, Melbourne and the Dogs both have won flags. Ever think shit or not? Or uh, what could have been? I know you, you won't say it because we love the Blues and you love the Blues and as I said, you'll be a Hall of Famer. But do you ever sit there and go, fuck, could have uh, been me? Yeah, not not particularly. I, yeah. I, 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 I've... I take a fair bit of joy out of, although it's been bloody hard, yeah. but to be able to build something from essentially, I probably got there on the the slight little the decline, and then the bottom, the pit, and then literally bottom, yeah. To come back out the other side, and um, Cripper and I have been like on that journey together. Mm. I think we're the only two left now. Ed was there last year, but yeah, to feel like you built something, and hopefully. Hopefully we can win a flag at the back end of my career. Yeah. I've, I've now got to a position where if that doesn't happen, I'll be okay with that, and which right. is probably the perspective that I've gained over my career. Um, if you asked me that five, six years ago, I'd, I would have been 100% yeah. shattered if I – like don't get me wrong, I, like I want to win a flag, and but I don't, just don't think my career is going to be defined by that. No, which definitely is, not. Which I think is a healthier mindset. Still trying to win the flag <laughs> definitely drives so. me I con- think so. considerably. But um, yeah, I, I think – for whatever it's worth of – my career could have gone completely different if I went to – there's a lot of what-ifs if I'm exactly. at the Dogs or at Melbourne that things might have happened in a different way and I might – who knows, could be out of the system. You just don't know. So, um, yeah, yeah. I'm a big believer in your journey is meant to teach you things in life. And, and your journey has. Um, yeah, being and coming to Carlton and going through – what we've gone through has taught me some of the bigger values that I have in my life. So it's – Also um, your life experience as well. Yeah. taught you so much that probably make footy now, now that you're the back end of it, you're like, footy is just, it's footy. At the end of yeah. the day, we love it and you love it. And of course, you don't want to flag, but life is so big. Yeah. Well, footy footy is not everything to no. me in, anymore. And it was at one point. It was. Pro- probably when to, I first and met you, it, was. it was. It was probably to an unhealthy yeah. um, level. So being able to gain some perspective and some distance and um, I still love footy and I have a lot of drive to be the best mm. and take Carlton to the, the next premiership. But um, at the same time, I don't I don't go home dwelling on no. what happened during that day, and um, I'm more present for my friends, and my family, and um, I think that's a really healthy thing now. Mm. Um, I wish I'd sort of knew it a little bit early in my career. Yeah, well, you could enjoy me, mate. Just pick up a paycheck, and we could have been <laughs> early together. <laughs> This episode of Dan Does Footy is brought to you by Sportsbet. If you're not on Sportsbet at the moment, you're living under a rock. Um, I was at the pub the other day with a few mates and we wanted to put a multi on and one guy got his phone out and I looked over and it wasn't the Sportsbet app and we told him to leave immediately. So thank you Sportsbet for being an amazing partner of the Dan Does Footy show. We have some huge things coming this year with our mates at Sportsbet. So keep your eyes out, especially in March. Something big is coming. That first preseason, so bottom of the barrel with the Blues, Flagstaff, yeah, shithole, yeah, well, absolute shithole. Well, my my yeah, my Flagstaff experience in Arizona, which we're going to talk about, yeah, which was yeah, it was horrible. Yeah. So I just remember Flagstaff to those just to paint a picture, just not that it's important at all, but it's you go there to do a preseason training camp, yeah, and it's freezing cold, it's high altitude. And you're running everywhere. I don't know if you did. We did the Suns. We ran everywhere. Well, it was snowing by the time we got there. So Awesome. We- <laughs> Great. That's good. That's a good thing. Good spot to go for a Great free spot. camp with some snow. And then they take you up this mountain. Can't remember the mountain. I'm sure you did it. Mount something. Did you uh, do the mountain? Yeah, we did the mountain. And then they take you up there and in, what we did in groups of six, every 10 minutes groups of six leave the, the bottom, the base, and you go up. Anyway, you all catch each other at the top and the guy's like, okay. And it's blowing absolute gale up there, like like life or death up there. And the arms director was like, okay, I'm going to go to um, the summit and see if you guys can get up there. He's taken off 50 metres and <laughs> blokes almost rolled off the hill with wind. And then it was just war, World War Three up there. Get down the hill, get down the hill. <laughs> just one of the worst experiences I've ever, ever had in my life. But as you said, your Flagstaff experience was different because on – December 15th, that phone rings. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I've, so I'd been traded in uh, like mid-November. Yeah. Um, 
basically met my teammates for a, a week and a half before we going on this camp. And um, about a week and a half in, I was injured at the time. I had um, a immune disease in my eye that I was trying to figure out what that was. And um, yeah, I got we went out for dinner with, at, at a teppanyaki place in um, in Flagstaff and. Um, my brother started calling me a couple of times on my phone. And I thought, oh, that's like that's a bit weird. That's, mm. He doesn't, he doesn't. <laughs> me and my brother don't talk yeah, on the phone. He we do me? now, but back then, getting a phone call from him was bizarre. And, yeah. Um, then I sort of got a tap on the shoulder, and Shano, yeah, Shano, because yep. I gave before we left was I'll give it, give your family members yeah. Shane's number just in case they need it. Um, tapped on a phone call from Shano, and um, it was my um, it was my auntie. No, sorry, no, it was no, it was Nat. Sorry, Nat was on the phone and Nat said um basically that Josh had rang Nat so Nat could get in contact with me and that my dad had just passed away. Um and part of the phone call was um my mum was at my auntie's house doing a move and my brother didn't have my auntie's number, couldn't get a hold of my mum, but I had my auntie's number. So then I called my auntie from Arizona to get mum on the phone and then I had to tell mum that dad had passed away and um, it's still a memory that sticks with me because it was just it was just my mum just like harrowing on the other end of the phone like um, just yeah it's there's there's one thing of losing a parent there's another thing of losing cool. a parent when you're on the other side of the world yeah. um, with a bunch of people you've met a week and a half mm. basically earlier um, but I was, I was very lucky that the, the footy club were unbelievable they sent someone back with me yeah. um, to make sure I got home and um, yeah, incredibly tough nice. part of my life. Um, my dad was a massive influence on my, especially my footy, as, as we've spoken about before. Um, I grew up at the footy club basically following my dad around yeah. um, in terms of where he coached and the players he coached. And then um, he ended up coaching my brother, then coached me. Um, so just a massive influence on my my sporting life and my footy life specifically and then mm. more broadly just as being his son. But, um, yeah, just a like a wild um, crazy, wild little period of time in my life um, being traded and having injury, immune disease that we thought might have been cancer, which wasn't in the time yeah. and having dad pass away all in my first three months of being at the footy club. Um, it's like what the fuck? This is yeah, hammer. just, like just why? crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. There's there's still elements of now these days that um, that I wish he was still here because everything yeah. that happens in my life is sort of a, and I'm sure a lot of people would um, sympathise with this, but everything that important happens in your life, you always think back to your dad being there. So obviously, just had Ruby a year and a bit ago, but mm. then it sort of it brings back up that he's not here and yeah. um, it's yeah. tough, it's tough, it's tough. Yeah, yeah. Knows it is, and it's a, it's a it's a hard part of life, and yeah. Um, but it's a great reason of why I play footy and my purpose that I have these days. So yeah. Um, oh mate, it's it's just yeah. Obviously, it's so I'm so sad, really. And and you think why why me? Like um, you know, everything's going okay, and then you have all these incidents happening. Like what is going on here? And I have no doubt I didn't I didn't meet Eddie, but I have no doubt he's up there looking down, just fucking amazed and proud of everything you're doing now. So, um, I'm sorry. It's yeah. I know I've I know we've spoken about it before off this podcast, but. Um, yeah, I'm really sorry you had to go through that. So, um, your first two years at Carlton, there's no natural segue for that. Um, <laughs> sorry, yeah, I don't know. There's no, uh, okay, uh, Carlton. <laughs> um, first two years at Carlton, you, first year you missed at Brizzy, second year you play your 13 games. Now you're at Carlton, um, you've just had this all happen. I feel like there's a couple years there at Carlton where you find your groove at AFL level. And you think, oh, I can now. I'm a I'm an AFL player. At what point did everything click and you go, I'm I'm good at this? Um, yeah, probably somewhere in that the sec my second year, I think it would have been 2014. No, 2015. Your second at 2015. Um, I think it would have been. Um, yeah. yeah, my first my I was talking about that whole off season. Um, I had all sorts of issues. I was on some pretty heavy drugs for an immune disorder that I had. Yeah. Um, I missed the first six games because I had a knee clean out really close to the start of the season. Fuck. And I think I came in at round seven or something like that yeah. and then played the whole back end of the year. Um, we had some we had some really talented halfbacks at that stage. So I was sort of just out there yeah. just playing a role. Um, had Chris Aaron and Simo who were killing it. And then 
Zach Tui sitting behind them and then sort yeah. of I was like our just mm-hmm. the guy coming in playing a role and um played reasonably well but like just focused on defending and yeah whatever yeah. I did in offense was great was good but um definitely wasn't sort of setting the world on fire for my first sort of year and a half and then um but I didn't I, I played that whole back end of that year and then played the whole year the yeah, year after yeah, and I think that repeatability of playing and then gaining the trust of my teammates and then knowing that my teammates loved playing with me gave me a lot of confidence that um, that I, I belonged at the level in, the, yeah. in an essence and started playing some good games over probably in the back end of that for my first year of 2014 and then some really good games in yeah. 2015. Well, it helps when you know that you might not be going out to Preston City Oval every second or third week. <laughs> like you know you're going to be in a good stadium and there's a routine and the bright lights of um, the AFL. So – 2016, play 70 games and win a BNF at mm. Carlton. That moment when you're on stage and you've gone through all the shit you've been through, your Brisbane journey, um, your dad, your your injuries, your surgeries, that moment on stage would have been like, whoa, wow. Yeah, well, to, to that point I hadn't – like I'd lost lost my dad. I'm not saying that's a small thing, but I hadn't gone through any of the stuff that was per, to precede those years. So yeah. Um, like I'd had some, I had some surgeries, nothing of significant major sort mm. of um, got over the eye issue. But, um, but that moment of standing on stage, like I, I just spoke about it a little bit before, but like my purpose of playing footy was, or still is, um, is to continue my dad's legacy. And my, my dad was a massive Carlton fan. And um, I feel like I carry that. He was a massive Carlton fan, massive footy fan, had a huge impact on me. So I, I feel like I carry um, – him with me on my career and yep. um, part of every achievement that I sort of gain as a, an AFL player um, etches my last name into the Carlton history books yep. and I feel like part of the whole reason why I play footy and probably part of the reason why I've got through a lot of the shit that I've been through is because in the back of my mind I'm always thinking about um, what he would do in these situations and he would never give up. His work ethic is something that I'd, I've been lucky enough to grab off him and yep. to be able to have that – um, coming through my career and I think that's sort of the, the prouder moments is is when you – not that you go out setting for a BNF or mm. any of those awards but um, when they – if they come up because you play well enough, it's sort of – that goes in the that, – that's in the books that can't yeah. be unwritten. That's always going to be – my name will be next to that 2016 year and um, inevitably that's my dad's, my dad's last name. So yeah. that's been a significant driver. We do a lot of work on why you play, like why you do what you do and – at the club, yeah, or just like the deeper meaning of what you why you're doing yep. it, and um, that's been the significant one over my career, yeah. um, still to this day. Um, which is, yeah, the, the probably the two was the, the BNF and the captaincy were two that, yeah, as much meant for me, but as much sort of, of meant for my dad as well. So, I love um, that. I love when you say, like, it's when I'm etched into history, football history, Carlton history, it's not my name, it's also my dad's, yeah. which is a beautiful thing to do. And yeah, and that's that's purpose. sort of that, that high purpose of why you play the game. If yeah. you don't have that high purpose, it's hard to go to the, as well. Yeah, well, it's as hard well. to go to the depth of when things yeah. go bad and when the shit hits the fan. Yeah. You need something that's bigger than just I want to play footy well, to get through it. Now I think I, I kind of wish I had a purpose <laughs> instead of just trying to get a paycheck to go to Universal every, every month. So, What's the purpose for this podcast? <laughs> Just to get a paycheck to go to Universal? Yeah, sure. <laughs> Buy some stringlets? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you Ooh. wear the stringlets up in the over in Brisbane? Do uh, the stringlets? They just went over your nipples pretty much and they were all oh, loose. Did probably. Brizzy have we, that kind of well, yeah, fashion or had, not? We were, we were necklaces when I was in my early years. Oh, like, like You have like a necklace with like a harmonica and stuff. Oh, like yeah, I missed that. I don't. No, <laughs> I, I didn't. I didn't get through the, um, the necklace phase. <laughs> all Australian 2017. And you were this year, you're, you're cooking here because I was there and I was playing twos obviously, but I went to your games because I had to go watch the games. Um, Bolts <laughs> made us. But you, you're you cooking in 2017, yeah. all Australian. 20, 2016 and 2017. Cooking. Were, uh, like almost like I know a lot of people like just talking about like you're just playing in flow, like everything was just like on repeat. Is that and, how you felt? Everything was yeah, just like coming to you? Yeah, like everything was just like happening and yeah. like was l- not low energy but like – you just sort of knew you'd go out there and if you did the right – like did the play the same way, then it just sort of yeah. th- things would happen and um, probably supreme confidence um, through mm. those two years. And, um, yeah, as much as sometimes I don't really like the All-Australian Award because it is opinion-based, it's sometimes mm. – it it's, nice it's, cool. rec- it's nice to be – it's nice to be recognised and to have it crossed off over my career. Saying that, I think Jacob Wiedering should have about three. In True. Front of so, so do I. I'm with you. I Good don't boys. think that it's a uh, – 
a fully accurate depiction no. of who the best team is in that year or who the best no. players are. So, but yeah. it's nice that for the recognition from external point of view, and um, I think those those couple of years were um, were great. But um, I know when we're gonna, probably going to go into this, but I, I feel like mm. this is the way that I think about it. But like, um, there's obviously some lessons that I need to learn, and yeah. um, footy has a well, life has a funny way of equaling equalizing that all out, and um, yeah funny how the, yeah the next couple of years were pretty well, tough yeah pretty tough it's um it amazes me obviously you're all australian but it amazes me more that you still you wear the jacket out at dinner sometimes <laughs> just to flex on me like we'll be at dinner ollie and he'll just rock up and i'm like what are you wearing he's like oh this old thing <laughs> just no, just a band or it? something is it home is it home yeah yeah do you ever just put it on and be like oh baby is it fitted uh oh it's i think it's just a stock standard just a jacket fit, yeah but yeah it's at home it sits in my cupboard yeah it's a funny story. Nick Graham asked me um, oh, no. a while ago to if he could borrow one of my suit jackets for an event, <laughs> and I sent him through. A, I sent him through like five photos of jackets that I have home, and one of them was the Australian. That's one. that's <laughs> the biggest flex. I love that. That's so good. So I do the same. If I ever ever get in one of those jackets, which I never will, because that boat has sailed. You bet your ass I'm wearing that out to like in a I, wedding or something. Thought I was so funny. Yeah, it was great. That's a great gag. Um, you don't win the BNF that year. Murph wins it. That's a stitch up. Yeah, Murph pipped me. What the? I, you know what my theory is? That clubs, because you get a bonus when you win a BNF or come top 10, I assume. I would never know. <laughs> but I would never know, definitely. But I think personally clubs skew that so they don't have to hand the bonuses out, which is why you never saw me in a top 10 in the Suns BNF. <laughs> Checks out. Checks out. <laughs> but you don't win, Murph pips you. Yeah. Oh, like I, it all comes out. I, I think in 2016 that Simo should have won. So okay. I, yeah, of, right. I feel like it sort of equals itself out. Yeah. Um, I yeah. don't know, mate. I don't know. Like my, I thought my 2017 was better than 2016. Murph played really well in 2017 as well. So he it's did, like, yeah. But it's, they're all, you know, at BNF's work. The, the voting Crazy. system is um, often bizarre. It it's, actually is weird. Yeah, but, the, but the, every club's different. Our, ours at the time was based off your trademark game and um, – Oh, Craigie sometimes, system. Sometimes what that can happen is the, yeah. the better you play, your trademark gets higher. So mm. um, games that probably the year before I was getting nines or tens became sevens. So okay. the, yeah. the voting system. Did, and well, your ceiling was so high at this point that you, like you said, your 2016 tens were probably now eights. Yeah. Well, I, th- I genuinely like I thought Simo should have won in 2016. Yeah. Um, I was surprised that I won. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a, as I said, swings and roundabouts, mate. Yeah, I think I've Very come much. second. Yeah. Three so times now. You came what? What yeah, you say? Three second, three times. I think now. You have, yeah. I think so. You have. Did you get trophies for that? Yeah. Little ones. Little ones. Yeah. Just you the, have them as well. Uh, yeah, they're at home in a, yeah. in a box. Fuck! Home. I wish I was good at footy. I just love a trophy, <laughs> just any trophy. Um, peak of your powers, as we just said, 2016, 2017, top of your game. November 2017 preseason, mm-hmm. the knee goes. When you're – and I haven't done a knee, but I've always said to myself, if I ever did a knee, that would be the end of me because I don't think I could ever come back from just that moment of yeah. realisation of like 12 months, fuck. Yeah. You do one. What's the what's the first thing that you thought – and I know it's hard because it's so long ago and there's a lot happening, but what's your first – when you look back on it now, what was what would your mindset have been straight away? Um. Because you're at the peak of your powers. I was, like definitely, you are, I was definitely in a lot of denial. Because um, you're, at, you're at this point – one of the best players in the game. That's a stretch. As, well, no, you are. You are well, I'm, I don't like to compliment you, but you are. You are a top 20-something player, opinion base we know. But the next move to directory is I'm looking at Brownlow type-ish, top 10, five, and we don't know because that's obviously hearsay. But that was the trajectory. Yeah. Well, I, I think that to go to the question about the knee, mm. um, a lot of, yeah, denial and disbelief. I probably was in the same mindset of you as yep. if I ACL, you thought like you're pretty much done. That's just the the reality of the injury um, back then. There wasn't a heap of guys that were coming back and playing great footy off the back of him. So, no. um, but at the same time, probably had a level of naivety about yep. it that um, I just thought, I don't know why in my mind that I thought that I'd just come back and be fine and be good yeah. and yep. no stress. And um as I was saying before, life teaches you lessons. Literally. So when I, when I, what lesson do you reckon that was? Uh, because I, I'd uh, say life's fucked if I'm being <laughs> That'd be my lesson out of it. Uh, I would say humbling. Not, not yeah. We're not saying that I was an arrogant person, but I think there was, there was a level of humility that I needed to learn around. Um, things don't just happen 
in life. Like they, like you've got to work and you've got to earn them and yeah, um, yeah, whatever reason. I don't know. I don't. I don't I'm not like don't a god person, yeah. but I, I I somewhat believe in like a de- your destiny and stuff. And yeah, um, yeah. I whatever reason I had to learn had that to lesson. And to be honest, looking back now, it, it probably taught me some of the the bigger lessons in life that I needed to then be able to overcome what was coming next. So yeah. Um, before those knees, um, like if I was going to be sort of in terms of like my trusting circle of who I spoke to about like my life and my mental health and stuff. Like I had a very small circle and before um, probably during my first one, I realized that that, that's not a sustainable way of living. And um, I went on a process of probably 12 months of letting more people into who I speak to and um, went from probably uh, Nat and maybe Lockie Henderson to you, Puss, um, my mom, my brother. Yep. Um, and bringing more people in gave me a better network that when it happened again, the second one was like pretty brutal because that was the realisation that like this could legitimately be me done. Like to yeah. go back to back on knees, like I didn't, Crazy. Know, I didn't know anyone that had really done that. And so, pretty much the same time of the year. Yeah. Yeah, it would have been. So you, were you back training? So you've Yeah, I'd, I'd done a month of training. And then incident-wise, same? Uh, no, so the first one was non-contact, just change like your typical – change direction just knee buckles out yeah. second one i was doing like a one-on-one drill with charlie and yeah um we just bumped we bumped each other and because he's a big boy my like a lot of force went through my leg and then yeah. it was just sort of stuck on the ground and yeah. just rotated yeah. um yeah but yeah I, I think like that those those the two knees probably one get on top of my mental health because that was something that sort of hit me in with the second knee and then two was letting more people in on your life and yeah actually having to go on a process of um, exploring who those people are, having the conversations that are rather uncomfortable with those people about what's going on in your life and stuff that you're probably trying to hide from everyone. You've actually mm-hmm. you've actually got to be pretty vulnerable yeah. to be able to let other people in. And um, I look back now and think I was really lucky that, that that happened to me because it, yeah, it really opened up my mind and my world to um, being a better friend, what now would be a better dad, but better son, better yeah. partner. Um, yeah, those things lightened me up a lot and gave me a bit of pers- perspective around um, footy might not be next year because who knows whether I was going to come back from it. But um, yeah, I definitely probably I definitely needed to learn those lessons at that period of my life, and um, it's helped a lot. Man, hard lessons to learn. Like as you just coming out of, as I said, the peak of what you are to then go back to back knees, and in between those knees. 2017 knee named as co-captain so like a, here yeah. we go he comes a trough and then fucking back down again. again yeah crazy yeah and it's tough yeah. it's a tough lesson to learn like what yeah, am it I, is what well, am I, what's at, happening at, here? at times when you're going through it is you, you're asking yourself why like i think most people do that but that the poor me why me sort of yeah. narrative is definitely probably part of um that period of my life and uh, my strategy these days is more around you don't get to control what those things are in your no. life. And I've probably learned that recent, more recently, but things are going to happen to you whether you like it or not and you don't get the choice of some of it and some of it you're not going to like, some of it you'll love. Like some, yeah. of, the, some of the great moments in my life, you're, like, you're privileged to have them as well, but some of it you're not going to enjoy. But no. the, the bit that you do get control of is the way that you react to it, and the, the, your, your body language, your mindset. Um, your work ethic, like mm. those are things that you can control, and um, it's a good lesson. Yeah, well, like I, I probably more recently, I've always I've started to use that notion in my brain about like writing your own story. Yep. Like Vossi's spoken about it a lot, um, and it's probably clicked well with me. Is around don't let anyone else tell your story, and that that for me is like don't let the events in your life tell them, and don't let other people tell it. So it's you get to write your own chapter about what you are and how you react and how you do what you do and how you go through life. Um, I probably, I use that a lot these days in terms of stuff that happens to me. Like if you go to my knees and then I'm sure we're going to go into yeah. my cancer stuff is like, you can't control any of that. No. But you know. do control what you do after those points. And um, yeah, I've tried to use them as lessons to, to make me a better person and um, more recently give back to, to yeah. other people. So of course. Yeah, well, like I said, it's a it's a hard lesson to learn, and I'm I'm sure you're grateful now looking back on it. Do you, after the knees, 
did you get to a point where you come back? Because you do come back in the preseason of 2020? 2020, yeah. yes, because you play 2020. Yeah, when so you come back, you. do you – I think I know the answer. You're not the same or the same? And then does that change the way you play the game? Uh, different, yeah. Def- I definitely – I move different. You felt different? Yeah, well, I move different and I, f- I feel different. That's yeah. that's definite. Um, but – You've you're just decided to ask that because you're saying before that the game's coming so easily to you. I yeah. could assume that now you'd be like, well, fuck, I can't do that that I used to do. Or yeah, not really. Well, and they're good and bad. I'm definitely like not as explosive as I yeah. used to be and change the direction to, for that year definitely took a lot more sort of thinking time as opposed to just habitual land and go. go. Mm. Um, so that, that next year after coming back was I played reasonable footy but I didn't play very well. No. Um, but at the same time, I was still trying to learn with the the new parameters of what my body was giving you. And by I mean body, but I mean mind as well. Like yeah. giving the, the stuff that gets shoved in your subconscious mind of um, you don't even know is there. But then when you go and change direction or do something, then like it it gives that apprehension. So yeah. trying to work your way through that was um, was tough. But I think I've now learned that there's just aspects of my game that's different, and that's that's okay. You, mm. That's as you get older, that just happens generally whether yeah. it's injury based or um or age in terms of explosiveness and speed and stuff. So you just gotta find ways to adapt your game to what the demands are. And um yeah, I definitely I like the I've got completely different mechanics of how I change direction. The boys yeah. all take the piss out of me because I went to the <laughs> what stage. What is it just like a oh, semi it's like, trying to turn? Like just like the little bits like you, you you cut off different feet and you Yeah. Like So then you do that now subconsciously though, wouldn't you? Yeah I do it subconsciously yeah. now, but when like, it's Andrew Russell killed me when – obviously went over and um, saw Bill Knowles in the States and um, came back and he was fascinated with some of the change of direction stuff that we did. So then we started trying to teach the boys how to do it. Mm. But then by teaching the boys how to do it, you know what footy clubs are yeah. like. So then I'm out the front teaching them how to change the direction <laughs> off the other foot and like just got – Shreds torn off. Still to this day yeah. if we do like a, a change of direction drill – they're just like, what the fuck is this like, bloke like doing? It's sauce and it's like a couple of the other boys will yell out <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> turn off your inside foot, dog. So you can't, mate. I generally cannot. It's, it's built um, in me. It's ingrained in me. But yeah. No, yeah. It's, it's just different. It's a back to the yeah, question. It's okay. just like your, your body's yeah. different, but yeah. that adaptability of being able to play um, yeah. in a different way is just part of what you've got to get through. Well, at this point, at least you're back in, in this part of your, your journey yeah. and all the lessons you're learning. And you play the first, I think, from memory, it was around 15 games and then the diagnosis of testicular cancer. Yeah, so that that year was, again, a bit of a chaotic year. We came and played one game in front of no crowds. And COVID then, year, yeah. COVID year. So Sorry. We, so we played mm. Richmond against uh, in round one and then no we didn't one. even know if we were going to play. Like the night before, I remember the night before watching TV at home and like Gil McLaughlin came out at like 8 o'clock at night being like, no, nah, the game's going ahead. <laughs> so like that was literally the night before the game. So... Um, and then by the end of that weekend, footy was done. It was done. So then we had another eight. So I played one game back from my knee, then had about oh, eight, right. ten That's weeks right. off. That's right, training. Was that weird, that game? Uh, like really yeah, it was spooky? strange. Yeah, like it would have been. Strange. Like probably it just got a bit more normal because we did it a few more times. But Did they put sounds in the crowd? No, nah, not at that stage. Oh, they didn't. They'd do that eventually? They did it for the TV, not for us. Oh, okay. So for us it was just like sort of playing at training. Like you could hear yeah. everyone's voice and yelling and screaming and yeah. the communication was – much easier but mm. i think it was after maybe like three or four weeks they're like the telecast needs something here. Needs, so, this is so quiet <laughs> yeah the, 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 the uh the crowd noise but um yeah that year was just chaotic um yeah. like eight weeks pre-season training at home like just like running Crazy. up and down my driveway trying yeah. to get ready to play afl footy and then um we go to the hub and then we're at the hub um two questions before the like noticed a lump on my testicle in the hub Checked with the doc, docs. They thought it might be a cyst. So we're driving home from um, from Gold Coast back to Melbourne. Um, and he basically said, like, if it's not better by the time you get home, like, we'll just go and get it checked out. And we got, like, a, got the whole way down to Sydney. Then we had a night in Sydney. And um, I was laying in my hotel room and just started aching. So, like, mm. like just aching, like hurting. Deep ache? Uh, yeah, like a deep, deep ache. Yeah. And then, so then I got, like, a cold towel, put a cold towel on it. Didn't really do anything, so I like warmed it up, put a warm towel on it. That didn't do anything. What was it for? Just something. I was just trying to like therapeutic, like because oh, it, cool it, yeah, it was hurting. Okay, I, was like, yeah, like, yeah, I didn't know. Mate. I didn't know what I was like doing. Like an ice pack on it. Like, sort of like an ice pack. Yeah. Not <laughs> a great spot to pick up an ice pack. Balls. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so then like that happened, and then the next day we pretty much Nat just drove 
from Melbourne to Sydney in a Skiing day. Back. Um, got back like the next day, I think, got booked in for an ultrasound, went and had my ultrasound. Um, then got a call when I got back, well, when I was on the way home, mm. had to pull my car over. Mm. Um, got told that I, I had that I have testicular cancer. Um, on this phone call, he told me a bunch of details. I didn't listen to any of that. No, just tell me the main bit, then yeah. cried the whole way home, got yeah. home, then had to tell Nat, um, then had to call the doc back because I was like, man, I didn't hear a word. You said I had to sit can. Like, what, what am I doing? Yeah, tell me again. Um, so then next day, met, met with the surgeon and the day after that, I was in for surgery. Fuck. Um, Jesus. Yeah, just like crazy turn of events, really. Um, crazy. Yeah, the, the first, I think from if my first diagnosis of cancer was probably I just didn't know anything about it and I just, mm. all I thought was cancer, death. That's like where it's when my head went. That's the natural, that's, that's the natural yeah, progression. Natural thinking. Without any knowledge, prior knowledge of, that's not what I know now, but um, at that stage I was like, well, like, fuck, am I going to die? Like that's yeah, where, I, that's where my do. head was at. Yeah. It's not until I sort of had the meeting with the surgeon and then you get a bit of reassurance that it, like – Testing mm. cancer, really treatable disease. Um, get the op, and that should be okay. So then had the op, um, which like I got about a scar like that that big through my abdominal walls, yeah. uh, through to my abdominal wall to be able to get the testicle out. Um, which then that sort of provided my first sort of next challenge of my career was having all these cuts and stuff through my yeah. abdominal walls has been hard for my hips and groins and everything. So, um, but yeah, had to come back off that. Um, essentially the re- rehab was like a, like having a C-section as a, like for pregnancy. So you're not really allowed to do anything for strenuous six for, weeks, yeah. for like nothing strenuous for six weeks. So then having to go from that to build back up to play AFL footy um, was the, yeah, one of the first challenges. And then you play round one the next year after all that. Yeah. Played round one after that and then didn't think much of it. Um, yeah. Played the whole, I think I played the whole year pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that was the year. I might have might have hurt myself that year. I think I might have done my cinders that year. But yeah. played that year. Um, back end of that year was um, when the stuff was going down with Teague and the internal internal review and everything. And mm. um, yeah, I got regular regular checkups for three every three months, CTs and bloods. And it was like my mid my late sorry late season, but like mid year um, scans um, showed up that I'd gone from one scan having like nothing to stage four. <laughs> Um, testicular cancer so it had moved into all my lymph nodes so it was all through my stomach all through my lungs um, which then sort of set on upon the next sort of chapter of um, the chemo and all that was which was next the next stage is like I mean again just your roller coaster is just the only word is fucked really I mean you do two knees come back now you're doing two rounds of chemo or therapy or treatment mm-hmm. This, did you do chemo the first time or not? No, nah, so the first time was just the op. Just the op. So you do chemo this second time. And yep. this is, I remember seeing you because I think we're still in COVID. We're still in COVID, yeah. We yeah. And we, you and I, you especially because you were going through treatment, couldn't see anyone. You were in the front room of your house, yep. locked in pretty much away from that. Yeah. And I remember seeing you through a window and you looked for the first time. It's not often you see a man and you're like, fuck, he's sick sick. Yeah. You were sick sick. Like I was really I was, sick. I was horrible. Crook. Yeah, that yeah, would have been like, that would have been scary to look in the mirror and be like, "I'm not me anymore." Yeah. Well, like after the first, um, after like the first round, like it was tough, and I like I did I hadn't prepared myself for like the sickness that you had with it. But it was probably the second one when all my hair was coming. Like when I'd like I could pull like just chunks, chunks of my hair out, out. and mm. um, that was probably the moment where I was like, "Oh wow, this is actually like." I'm starting to look pretty grim here. I went like I was paler because we're in COVID, so vulnerable, immuno vulnerable person. So um, yeah. we made the decision. Well, it wasn't a decision at the start. We got put into two sets of lockdown because yeah. Nat was going um, to the doctors and stuff, mm. doing IVF, which is yeah, smart, yeah. smart, yeah. By, smart by us. Yeah. <laughs> just really throw it awesome. all in on one piece. Oh, but, yeah, um, we got that was in the days. It was two hour, uh, two two weeks of ISO. So we essentially went like. Two weeks of ISO in for my week of treatment into two weeks of ISO into my week of treatment. So by the time I'd really seen anyone other than really saying hello through the front – Through the window. Through the front window at my place. Hadn't really seen anyone and, um, yeah, incredibly, like, lonely time. So like, it was really just Nat and I just locked in a, in a house mm. um, other than, yeah, had friends that, that 
sort of popped by and came and chatted to me outside my window for an hour every now and then or playing playing games yeah. with my mates on like on PlayStation. PlayStation. That was really all I did. And yeah. um my treatment cycles were were incredibly tough. That's just like the 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 regime that we went after with my oncologist was based around not leaving me with any like lung scarring because yeah. it didn't want to affect footy. So my brain was already probably shouldn't have been there, but um we should have just been on just getting treated and what's the best treatment. But yeah. I, we both made the decision that there was a treatment that I could go down that was going to minimise lung scarring so then would, wouldn't impact my ability to go back and play AFL. Yeah. Um, but it was five days, basically five days straight of about, I think it's about, it was about 17, 16 to 18 hours on the drip. You have about 16 <laughs> out, you have about six hours off and then you, you roll again and you do that for five days straight. Um, and essentially just the whole point of, the chemo is just to to break you down over the space of the chemo kills everything, doesn't yeah. it? First, it has to kill it just everything. Just kills cells. That's yeah. that's its job. Yeah. So by the end of the five days, I was at like the absolute pit of where you could take someone, and then yeah. would would spend a week with some some drugs to be able to build my immune, like to, to give me a bit. So basically, at the end of my five days, my immune system was at basically the lowest it could get to. Fuck. So then the next week was built around building my immune system back up, basically to have three days of feeling good to then come back in and just absolutely flog it again. And that's sort of, that was the regime. So over the space of, I did four cycles. So the space of um, that three week cycle, so about three and a half months was just in this. Yeah. And like, I, like my, my memory of it is like, Nat would make me like lunch and I'd, cause it was so, it would make you feel so sick. Like mm. she'd make me like a burrito for lunch. And I'd like sit there for forty five minutes to be able to take five bites because I just couldn't. I couldn't, just eat. couldn't. I just felt so sick. Um, <laughs> stupidly was trying to train through this time as well, which is just yeah, actually during your chemo. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm an idiot, and like I, I, I fully respect that I'm. And you not are quite an idiot. Right. You're actually an idiot. Yeah, like, like you're I not was... mentally. You're not quite right, are you? <laughs> <laughs> like in the nicest way possible. You're not quite. You're a different. You got that dog in you. Like you're. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I don't. I look back now. I'm like, oh, what the fuck are you doing, mate? Like, yeah, you're in chemo. Like, you're getting Lit- just, just like you might be chemo. the first person in chemo to decide I'm going to start getting fit for a preseason. I was year. doing some stupid shit. I don't know what story I was telling myself in the head, but like we were going through an internal review, and I was <laughs> logging in on Zoom meetings from from the hospital. Like, like, mate, just take it chemo. easy. Like, like I don't know, like <laughs> what you were thinking. Like we're getting review findings, and we're going through like the coach sacking and stuff, and I'm sitting there on the fucking screen. Yeah, just like, with no just hair, just going, how good is yeah, this? Yeah, I mean, like, and then in between that, yeah, going for going for runs, like trying to punch out a run. Mate, you're off your head. That is crazy. The worst part about like the – one of the side effects to um, the chemo was like – essentially I was like – you laugh at this because you mm. probably think it's me all the time, but I'm mm. pretty much like allergic to sun. So like – Oh, I could see that now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, yeah. I, I, yeah it's, it's a low-hanging <laughs> fruit. But at the time, like if I went out into UV light, I would like break into hives. Your skin though was like – uh, raw chicken skin. Yeah. Like it's the same texture and yeah. same color. Yeah. yeah. It was, yeah. It was, but yeah. So I was like going to run and I could only like, <sighs> by, I think it was by like my, oh, maybe just before my third cycle, I went for a run. So I sent my run into like the, the my group of, at the club and I went for a run and um, I nearly passed out on the run and I went home and like, sat in the bed and that's like you're right i was like oh i think i just overdid it then and she's like yeah you're not running again <laughs> no shit so you telling anyone that you're running or not Are you telling, uh, so the doctor says hey mate how are you feeling yeah oh, pretty good so just ak run and we well, yourself well the doctor said you can do light exercise which I okay took, an I ak run is just not like light exercise, exercise. <laughs> just half marathon no i was i was trying to complete running sessions that the boys were doing but not to the intensity that they were doing it yeah i mean but that's stupidly just, like i just, like Light exercise probably meant go for a fucking walk. Like, yeah, but, and you're pumping out yeah. beans for Parade 8K runs. Mate, wild. And then even more wild is you rock up pre-season and decide that – well, I think you probably got ticked off at this point, but your pre-season, you rock up – and I'll probably jump too far here, but the club makes a decision to take the captaincy off you mm-hmm. and give it a crip of soul. Did you think you could still captain though at that point or did you semi-agree with the club, you know what, maybe I should step away and focus on getting healthy and right and back? Yeah. Because no. I looked at it saying I still think he's the leader of the club as a fan, as a supporter. I, th- I think like hindsight now, I definitely think was the right call. I, yeah. Like I wasn't in a position to be able to – like I didn't even know if I was going to be able to get back and play. Like yeah. in, my, in my mind, I thought that I was 100% 
yeah. going to come back and play. But like realistically, I probably who who knew to be because you hadn't really missed footy. You were just sick. Yeah, you know? I was just crook. Yeah, but it was just the unknown of like there's not. Again, it's you're sort of in uncharted territories that like guys come back from hamstrings, guys come back from cars. Like not too many people have chemo and then come back and play. So it's like, no. um, who really knew? And like, I think Cripps an unbelievable leader, and I think he's taken without me there with him. I think he's grown mm. significantly, and I think that he's like also don't really mind anymore. Like I'm like I'm I. I know my role at the footy club and as you said, like I'm, I'm still a leader at the club yeah. regardless of what any of the titles Title. say. And, mm. um, but it definitely took me some time to Would've. come to terms with what that was going to look like. And um, yeah, I, I know my role at the footy club and I know yeah. that it's really valued now. Yeah. And um, the initial shock of it all was, was pretty full on, but yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. now I'm probably, probably so content and happy with, where my life's at and um, yeah. comfortable with what my role is and the people that I'm helping and by me stepping down allowed like guys like Weeders who like he's like a little brother to me. So being mm. able to have him step up and stuff has given me a lot of joy. So sure. Um Yeah. It's always there's always that jolting you know that like, oh shit, maybe yeah. and again another seat of like maybe I'm not maybe these eight K runs are and, and losing a captaincy, they're probably telling me that I sh- should slow down and focus <laughs> and maybe I'm not gonna come back as you said. But at this point your dad's passed away in your career. Your dad's passed away. Two knees, two bouts of cancer. Surely now everything's in perspective. You're just going, if I go back to footy, great, but my life is now. Everything's in perspective. Footy's in everything. At the start of my career, I wanted to be the best player and if you're not with me, you're against me. I'm going to drag the footy club to wins and success. Now you're like, you know what? Footy is footy and whatever. Yeah, element, elements of. I, I think it's still to this day – even probably coming to Ruby it still taught me more lessons around it. Yeah. Like that on the back end of that, that my chemo. Yeah. Um, I probably went into overdrive of like, I'm going to get back and play. And like, that's where my head was at. Like I, mm. I, I threw everything into getting back playing that to playing round one that year. Um, but I definitely reckon that as I've grown through these years, I've, yeah, as I said before, it, I'm now at a stage where footy is and everything yeah. and it's given me a lot of distance and yeah. um, a lot of enjoyment in footy as opposed to just like expectation of trying to make 1% games. And now it's now I love just going to the club and I'm enjoying, which probably I think a lot of players when they get older would be like this anyway, but mm. you enjoy going in and and the environment for what it is because you know that it's it's actually not forever. It's and not, no. You get to thirty, you've done a good job. So every every year past thirty is sort of like yeah. sports science and stuff is unbelievable this day. So players will play longer than they have, but um, you do know that footy somewhere you're somewhere near the end at some stage soon, and um, yeah. yeah, you don't want to spend the back end of your careers, um, the back end of your career, not enjoying the environment for what it is. And um, I, off the back of all those injuries and stuff, um, definitely sort of solidified that. Yeah, yeah. You just said before that. In your mind, you were like, I'm playing round one. And you started telling these people that you're letting close to your circle that you're playing round one. And when you told me you had no hair, your skin was like a raw chicken, and the wind could knock you over. Yeah. And I said, This guy's off his dick. Like, you are so sick, mate. You're not gonna play round one, you rock up and play. Surely, did you surprise yourself being like, uh, I'm not human? Like, this is crazy. This is crazy that you're playing round one. At at the time, I there was in my mind there was no way I wasn't playing so like now if I'm looking back now mm. how I was able to do that that sort of three month period of going from as you said I was eight nine kilos underweight <laughs> um I had done a few run, a few runs while doing chemo, yeah, a few but okay runs that they they didn't help me that much yeah. when I was trying to get back to running but also had Andrew Russell tell me um he said I, I don't want you running for your joints I don't want you running until you've got your weight back on so there's no point in running. I actually thought he had, like we we thought that it was going to do me more damage and it was going to help me to run with no no muscles on like on my legs for my knee joints and my ankles and stuff yeah. and even my soft tissues. So um yeah, I finished my chemo in I think it was like mid November or something along those lines and um I spent the next sort of 5 weeks just eating and like doing light exercise to put some size back on going to the gym. Yeah. I didn't run until just before Christmas. Yep. Um, and then just late in a preseason. Yeah. So like December twenty, and then I yep. played. 
I played in the VFL practice game. Um, well, I think our season started like March 15th. So I think I played it like the 2nd of March or something. So your goal with the club was that you say at the start, I'm playing, they go, you're kidding yourself. Then it comes more of like a realistic target. They say to you, let's get your body right because the footy's going to be okay. And if you get your body right, we'll play you. Is that yeah. how it kind of went? Well, Vo- yeah. Vo- Vossi tells a funny story of um, he got the job and I met him in the park out the front of my house yeah. in Richmond, which is <laughs> sort of my meeting point for a little bit. <laughs> um, and um, – He's like, oh, what's your, so what's your goals for next year? And I was like, oh, I'll, I'm, I'll play round one. And he tells a funny story of like in his mind, like he was in in the person. He was like, oh, that's that, that'd be that's an awesome goal, blah blah. And then he's sitting there in the back of his mind, goes, there's no fucking way he's going to do yeah, this. No way. This is um, just so it's so it's not stupid, dumb. It's, it's just, yeah, well, yeah. mate, it's just naive. I think it's just yeah, and not because it's in your nature not to think like that. But I'm like, this is so dumb that he thinks he can do this. Yeah. Well, yeah, it probably is, and. Yeah, still to this day, I, like I, it's funny because everyone says like, um, like there's always been this preseason myth, like not myth, but like the preseason of like you would have heard in footy, mm. it's like you need to do eighty percent of preseason oh, to, have yeah, a, the to have a good chance yeah. of playing yeah. good footy during the year. Um, yeah, I I didn't train until basically the start of Feb. I did a calf in the middle of this somewhere after um, Nick Graham's wedding. Did my calf, so I missed a week of training there. But um, I essentially went from yeah December twenty in t- in two and a bit months. Um, went from not running at all to playing AFL footy. So and then you come runner up in the BNF. Yeah, and then played every. <laughs> that game. is so fucked, then play, mate. Then you then know played, how fucked this is. Played the whole, played the whole, ended up playing the whole year, every game. Which, to be honest, there was part of my goal was that was like, once I played, it was sort of like, I wanted to bust the myth of the eighty percent preseason. So now you can tell them all the time, like I don't need that. <laughs> like I don't need that. You well, know, it's, great, I don't it's great for telling the story as I get older that I don't. Yeah. need to, I don't need to do the whole program. <laughs> That's just, I'm not like just off. So, f- just crazy. Like to have such a good year. I want to talk about that round one, mm. that goal. In the moment, because it was so just beautiful and perfect. In the moment when that fifty meter penalty gets called and you go inside the forward 50 into your range of kicking which is about 30 meters <laughs> set, shot, you, set shot I got, set I got, shot I yeah give, i could give you big balls did you sense shot. what that meant to the people that have been behind you yourself your family uh cancer survivors people who have had some kind of cancer in their life did you sense this occasion of like if this goes in this is big no 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 i, okay. I like you were just playing i was just playing like in that like I don't know whether it's well, I don't know whether everyone does this, but like like one of the skills that, like that I have is to put everything aside when I go out and play. I, I just go out and play. Yeah. And I'm thinking too much about like I play the game quite broad, and I'm thinking a lot about like scoreboard setups mm. and like scenarios and games. So I don't really have much time to you think know. about anything outside of that. Yeah. So um, at the time, no, but yeah. I've definitely got an appreciation from it now. Just the way that everyone reacted and. My teammates, my like family, friends, um, it was people crazy. around the state. Like, like, there's a bit of vision um, that I look back on now. It's like I take a mark, like late. It's like late in the game, and the pen, the camera sort of pans back, and the whole of the crowd behind me stands up and applauds, which is like pretty cool to to Wild. like think back now. And um, that memory is like just etched in my brain of like just one of the most yeah. unbelievable one the journey to get there and I, i'm still a, a little bit disbelief of how i was able to do it but then to go out there and play i played well and then to have the moment of like Vossi's first game we hadn't beaten richmond in t- 10 to 12 years yeah. um added on layer of that was the goal and the way we played and the way we finished the game like it's just the, like it's, it's just a beautiful footy moment um and especially after everything you've gone through yeah like this is just like the journey had to lead me here. Yeah. And then like, it was just a really, as I was saying before, like life gives you great lessons and some of them are great and some of them are really bad. And I'd been Crazy. through a lot of bad ones that, um, that I'd been able to sort of come across and then to be able to have that as, as a, as a, the other way, mm. um, just a really cool moment to be a part of. Mate, it's actually like, I don't know, like just you as a human, uh, unbelievable, everything you've gone through, there's not many players that, come out of the AFL, even players who do play 300 games that leave an impact on people, fans, no matter you go for Carlton, no matter you, no matter you go for um, Collingwood, no matter if you're the one Suns fan, there's not many people who can leave an impact on all the AFL. Does that, is that something you go, 
if I don't win a flag, I've, I've left my mark here and my career is content. I know you said it a bit before, but surely you look at what you've done for the game and, and what the game's done for you and go, this is pretty cool. Well, I, I think that's it's definitely something – like you don't set out to do that in your career no. and I, I would be like every other AFL player that wants to come in and win brown lows yeah. and play 300 games and stuff like that and it's taken um, – until yeah, probably recently where I've I've now realised that like my impact on my impact on footy is 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 greater than winning premierships and BNFs and mm. um, I get a lot of enjoyment out of of that and being able to have an impact on people that are generally doing it quite tough and to being able to being the ins- like the inspiration of what can be done mm. when you're going through a really shit time and a lot of people it's like a lot of cancer patients and stuff going through a horrible time right now. Mm. But the amount of stories and um, messages and stuff that I get off people that like have come out the other end of their cancer diagnosis and have like in the pit of it were thinking about like watching me play footy and, and thinking like what can be. Mm. Um, like I met a kid the other the other week when we were, I was handing over the checks for the Jim Steins Award and he essentially like when he was going through his testicular cancer battle was like, I was giving him. I just had Ruby, and I was giving him hope about having, having a, still being able to have a family. And it's wow. like that stuff is like it, it does touch you, and it doesn't. It, it does make you feel um, that you're having an impact, and that's probably why I got to the stage where I feel like I've succeeded, regardless of whether. Like a lot of my mindset early in my career was like I need to win a flag. Like that's what the mindset is around that. Fellas, yeah. like if you don't win a flag, your career is not successful. I don't think that's true, but. It's taken a while for me to even get that narrative out of my own head of like if I don't win a flag across my career, I'd, I see my career and as, as as a complete success because of the impact that I've had in other areas. And um, yeah. as I said before, it doesn't stop the drive and the want to win and and, and taste that success and taste the that moment. But it does make me feel okay that when I transition out of the game, whenever that is, that if it doesn't, go to the ultimate goal, I'll be okay with that and I'll yeah. be okay to walk away with the game on my own terms and be be fine with what I've done. Mate, you're an amazing human being and it's, it's, as we just you know spoke about and I hope everyone who listens to this can appreciate just the, the amount of stuff you've gone through and then coming out the other side and now there's still this, this thought process and mentality to be like, I want to do more for others and help others when you could be so self inwards and I go look after my own backyard and I got to get as much as I can out of my career. It's, it's, it's a credit to you. I want to talk about one more thing before we talk about this year, because I'm very excited about the lids coming off. Brisbane prelim first quarter. I'm fucking off my head at home. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm booking for grand final tickets. Crazy. First, let's talk about first quarter. Crazy. Cause you wouldn't have done a lot in the first quarter in terms of not coming your way at all. Uh, well, I did Oh, here he is. I was setting everyone up. I'm the reason for it. <laughs> <laughs> I kicked a goal. I set up. The oh first, yeah, that's I right. Goal assist the first goal. Yeah. Um. Because I because I done my shoulder the week before. Yeah. I wasn't. I was sort of playing a bit out of position. I couldn't play inside mid because I just wasn't confident enough. Yeah. To bash and crash in there, so I played a bit more outside, um, outside role. But yeah, that first quarter was crazy. Crazy. Like, I just, man. like we just played the exact version of our brand that. And it, like we just were able to like do that, and like they had no answers they, that no, first they quarter. And and credit to them, like, and this is why they've they've been up there for a while. And mm. that would bury a lot of teams, like what the 100%. what we did in that first quarter, and the like the nature that we played would bury a lot of teams, and it didn't bury them. And then their ability to change the game yeah. really mm. hurt us, and our inability, and probably our inexperience to be able to yeah. deal with what they then threw at us was. Um, probably showed the difference between a side that was in there the first time and one that had been in prelims exactly. and failed yeah. um, for a number of years before that. So yeah. um, Crazy. Because as you said, like this was literally your first final two weeks before that and yeah. a lot of the boys' first final. So to have that experience of being like, we've got to kick the team in the teeth up in Brizzy and they'd be like, okay, there's a tsunami coming back. That's going to yeah. be – but that's leads me into this year. Let me, let me ask some rapid fire questions first for this year. <laughs> Do the boys talk about me? Uh, no. Okay. Do they, they, they like my post game videos about lids they coming do, off? They do. They do. They find Thank the post game videos very, very. Uh, the, but when you lose, do they like them or not? Yeah. They, okay. like, I think they just find them hilarious. Love that. Do they ever talk about me? And was there any word pre game about marching an army of blue baggers over the bridge? Um, no. 
I would okay. say no, but like maybe. Okay. Do you – don't just give us an answer because you want to – actually, no, give us that answer. Can the Blues win a flag this year? Oh, I'd, Are you going to say yes, but in your heart of hearts, do you look at the competition and go, we're as good as any, we can do that? Yeah, well, I think we're one of the better sides in the competition. I, yeah. And, but there's, it's, a long, it's a long year and AFL footy is a bloody hard game. So yeah. you've got to have the appreciation that there's a lot that's got to go right for you to be able to be swinging at the right time of year. And um, mm. you look at us last year, we, what did we lose? 10, 10 12 games yeah. and then won 14 straight playing a prelim. So um, you can't just assume that it's because happen. what happened last year is going to then happen this year. And um, we're confident of where we are as a footy team and we're confident in – what we're doing and what we're going to present. But we've also got an appreciation that every other team's doing the exact same thing at the moment. And where we feel like we're in the top echelon of the teams, where that lands us and what that ends up doing later in the year. Um, mm. I, yeah. I, who knows? But we've yeah. definitely got what we believe we, we've got what it, of course. The, the brand and the players to take yeah. us. And that was a loaded question. I obviously, you believe it, you wouldn't be playing if you didn't, but do you feel now that you've done so much good stuff last year and there is this real hype do you now feel it from externally? Because there was a lot of people coming for you your whole time you've been at Carlton now. Do you now feel this pressure of like, well, now you've got to be good after everyone was saying, stop being shit? Yeah. You know? Well, the, there's a – yeah, there's a, there's an interesting sort of dynamic that's in footy and um, Carlton's definitely probably on the – there's a few teams that are like massive supporter bases and very mm. passionate supporter bases – and just a lot of interest in what they do because yeah. like, that's just what it is. And um, we've probably tried every – over my career, we've tried everything from ignore the external media mm. to embrace it, to go out and say that you're going to win finals and then to sit there and say don't – no one talk about anything that's outside the four, world, four yeah. walls. The reality of what happens these days and we've done a heap of work on it because it's, we've had to is you've got to embrace – and understand that there is an external expectation on your footy club and you can't shy away from that because that's not a it's not a healthy way of coping. No. The important thing is you do is where you put your focus internally. And expectation is a it's it's a funny word because like what is, what are our expectations? They're just other people's opinions. Yeah. So I think being able to nail it down internally and about what you're actually going after and what are the important things to you as a group, that's the important stuff. As I said, you can't shy away because there is like there's a there's a there's a storm outside, and Massive whether one. that's good or bad, like I'm in it, mate. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm in it. Deep, you're leading trust it. Me. Yeah, I'm but no, it. That, that's that, like that's 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 what makes Carlton the great team to play. Like we, yeah. we have amazing fans that create that environment, and like our crowds at games and stuff are wild, and that's some of the great parts of footy. But you can't let the external impact internal in terms of where you're at, where you're trying to go as a footy team. And like mm. the, last year I spoke about the fire earlier, we went down, I was like that elements was like, okay, this is all happening. Except that that's part of footy and except that that's part of what we're dealing with, but we need to put our energy and our focus on something else. Mm. We need to put it on something that's tangible that we can actually do yeah. day to day to be able to get us to where we need to go. That will then get you in a position to be able to do what you need to do at that back end of the year. Yeah. But, I th yeah, it's hard. It, it, it's it's a tough part. It'd be hard footy. not to get carried away though as well because now you're in a point where for so long you've been bullied as a team. Now you can kind of push teams around. So I guess it's hard not to feed into that and then feed into this. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're the exact same yeah. lessons. They're just two yeah. sides of the coin. One's the bad side. One's the good side. You you can't live in those worlds. Yeah. You can't okay. you can't have that follow you and, and make the decisions of what you need to do. You yeah. need to – make sure that internally you're focusing on the right things that are going to get you from a process point of view to where you need to go. Every team wants to win the flag. Every team wants to play finals. And that's the just West Coast. like every player does. That's yeah. And different levels of like expectation from yeah. external of what that is. But internally you just can't, you can't live. That's not healthy to live that way. No. Then you start counting results. You start worrying about other things that you can't control. What you can control is the stuff that's in front of you. And that's the values you have at your footy club. That's, what you're going after from a defensive point of view. Like it's – they're the stuff that you actually have to focus in on internally. And mm. if you spend too much time on the outside distraction stuff, although it funds the game and it's it's a big part of fans and everyone's lives in, as players and coaches and internal staff, like it's just a dangerous message if you're just going to live on that roller coaster. Yeah. Equilibrium. Yeah. <laughs>
one of our great one coaches. One of our great words <laughs> from one of the great men, Brendan Bolton. Um, mate, that was unbelievable. Thank you for coming on. And I, is this, I don't know if it's the first time you've told your story at length, but it's an unbelievable story of just grit, determination. Probably wouldn't recommend the 8K runs going through chemo, <laughs> but you're just an amazing human. And I don't say enough, and I'm sure we don't, but we, I do love you. Thank you for being a great friend. Thank you for being the first guest on the footy uh, DDF footy show and let's hope the Blues win a flag this year because you can fuck that equilibrium off if you do. So <laughs> thank you, mate. Appreciate it. Thank you, mate. Thanks for having me on. Imagine what you could be buying instead. For free and confidential support, call the number on the screen or visit the website.